Welcome to Xeno Analysis. I am Colonel Rhombus, and today we will be taking a quick overview of the Tyranid bioform Tyrannicus gladius, or more commonly referred to as the Tyranid warrior. The reason for the Tyranids' presence in our galaxy is still unknown. Were they drawn by the Astronomicon? Were they driven out by something even worse than they are? Or are we just next? on a vast, universal menu. This will be explored in future lectures, but whatever the reason, they arrived in a form adapted to prey upon the last species to fall beneath their claws and teeth and other vile, abominable weapons. In none of the many bioforms is this more apparent than the Tyranid warrior. Initially, they resembled something akin to a blending of the reptilian and the insect, they were taller and more slender, perhaps suggesting worlds with lower gravity and maybe inhabitants far less adept at war than we are. They were most strikingly different in their far more exposed cranium with less chitin armor plating that was supported on a long and slender neck. Their torso had chitin plating with sporadic vents rather than the more familiar ribs. Their skin also had a more scaly quality with none of the vents seen in current warrior's bioforms, and their taloned extremities were akin to paws. Once the hive mind began to experience what it meant to wage war against humanity and the other Xenos occupying this galaxy, changes quickly began to manifest, and the Tyranid warrior was adapted to better suit the needs of battle. Armoured plates of chitin manifested to encase the physique, especially on the upper cranium. The vulnerable long neck shortened considerably and brought the now armoured head down towards the increasingly armoured shoulders. The warrior was now reduced to a lesser stature of just under eight feet, but was far more dense of limb and chitin defences, meaning that, despite these changes, the Tyranid warrior has weighed in at around 1.2 tons since they first appeared. Claws elongated to improve penetration and devastation to targets, and the scaly nature of their hide became smooth and was hardened against impacts. And then finally, the large, dense chitin crest, previously only seen on primes, became a staple for all Tyranid warriors as shoulder plates grew even larger and ranks of ribs reached out to embrace a thick breastplate of chitin to fend their torso, and finally the insect-like abdomen evolved into an extended reptilian tail, promoting improved balance. A staple of the Tyranid swarm the warrior is both highly adaptable to serve as a frontline offensive force, but also serves as a synaptic linchpin to extend the will of the hive mind and keep other bioforms under its dominion. And even then, there is an even more enhanced bioform, the Tyranid Prime, that serves to accentuate and sharpen the senses of other nearby Tyranid warriors, improving their combat accuracy. The horrendous presence of the hive mind also radiates from Tyranid warriors, the shadow in the warp hampering the ability of psychers to draw on and manifest their abilities. Tyranid warriors can be grown with toxin sacs. These parasitic glands contain numerous small mites that feed on the host organism. The damage they do to the host is negligible, but as they consume the warrior's flesh, they secrete a potent poison that coats the innate weapons of the Tyranid, not only causing grievous additional trauma, but they are also laden with the phage cells of the Tyranids. The term phage literally means to eat, and this is precisely its function. The phage cells attach to the host cells, injecting DNA and beginning the horrendous process of turning the unwitting flesh into raw material for the hive fleet. Also, adrenal glands can be grown to flood the warrior's system with chemicals to boost metabolism and catapult them into a state of near frenzy. Flesh hooks can also be incorporated into the warrior physique. 
these sharp barbs are born atop sinewy tentacles coiled into the warrior's ribcage. Deployed like grappling hooks, they can assist the warrior in scaling sheer surfaces, or more commonly, and in keeping with the tyranid's homicidal nature, to pierce a target and drag the prey into the melee weapons of the warrior. And with the addition of wings, and by sacrificing the denser layers of chitin armor, warriors can be evolved into a form called the Shrike, and that can bring death from the skies, while quickly maneuvering to reinforce the control of the hive mind across the swarm. The basic Tyranid warrior is grown with a weapon we have dubbed a Devourer. This weapon is a fleshy construct, intentionally created in a state of putrefication. This decomposing state being necessary to subdue the flesh worms that serve as ammunition and who have an insatiable hunger for fresh, warm, living tissue. The flesh worm is a small, parasitic life form that is incredibly well adapted for the deed that bestows its name. The rotting flesh hive of the weapon keeps them in a near dormant state until a bioelectric charge expels them at speed. Awoken and invigorated by the charge, the worms immediately and expectantly begin to exude a potent acid that helps them adhere to whatever they hit. The acid dissolves clothing and even armour, and when the worms sense the proximity of ripe flesh after having dwelt in the rotten hive, they explode into frenzied activity. Deploying their viciously sharp maws and tendrils, they pierce skin and delve into the hapless target. With incredible ease, the worms target the central nervous system and then make their way towards the brain and the spinal column, which they quickly consume causing a sudden but nevertheless excruciating death. Some devourers can be created to host brain leech worms, an even more ghastly but more complicated variant whose considerably stronger creatures burrow immediately for the target's brain where they feed with nightmarish alacrity. Tyranid warriors can also be generated with a death spitter. This bioweapon has a muscular channel which uses intense contractions to launch a lethal maggot from a reservoir of such creatures. The muscles can propel it much further than the devourer, and the maggot exudes potent acidic slime that dissolves flesh, bone, and armor with appalling ease. Hive Fleet Hydra has crafted a unique strain and can adapt the maggots further, bestowing them with an awful sense of self-replication so that once they strike a target they burrow into it, devouring biomass and using it to divide and grow, multiplying at incredible speed as the doomed target is eaten from the inside out while swelling and bursting from the wriggling population of slime and maggots infesting their tortured physique. Certain members of a warrior pack may also be grown with bio cannons in one of two forms. The first we refer to as a barbed strangler. Seeds are fed into a main tube of muscles that, like the death spitter, flex and propel the seeds over a great distance. Upon impact, they leap into life, sending out probing roots and tendrils in all directions, growing rapidly to crack, shred, and destroy their immediate surroundings. The second is the venom cannon which uses an electrostatic charge to hurl crystal shards at enormous speed and over great distances. The initial high-velocity impact can punch through even the most vigorous armour, but anything not killed by this trauma now faces a dual second assault as the crystal shards dissolve and spill a powerful substance that is both a mighty corrosive agent that can dissolve metal and even stone, but also a vicious poison lethal to all life forms. The basic Tyranid warrior is most often grown with scything talons, razor-edged chitin claws capable of gouging open flesh and tearing apart solid objects. Rending claws are composed of exceedingly dense chitin and are deployed by overdeveloped tendons of such potency that they can plough through even the toughest forms of armour and are 
devastating to flesh. Bone swords are a living creature in their own right. The pommel of the sword is a living brain with a subtle intellect that is devoted solely to maintaining its weapon body and a lethal monomolecular edge. The warrior's significantly greater intelligence courses through this secondary sentience, and as a direct consequence, the sword blazes with psychic energy that allows it to cleave through corporeal matter. The lash whip is formed from three tentacles of living muscle with bony hooks sprouting from the tip. A deadly weapon in its own right, the true lethality of the lash whip manifests when the warrior organism to whom it is attached is slain. When this occurs, the death throes of the lash whip are maniac and deadly. New data is emerging from the Octarius sector. The disgraced former inquisitor Fidus Kriptman implemented a disastrous stratagem that has been revealed as the arrogant folly that it always was, thereby justifying his expulsion from the Inquisition. After coaxing the abominations of High Fleet Leviathan toward the Octarius Sector and into the Orc Hordes festering there, the two have been engaged in relentless, unending conflict. The forces of the Cordon Impenetra are seeing new adaptations in the bioforms as they evolve from their countless engagements with the Greenskins and spill out into the surrounding space with these new enhancements. It seems that certain creatures are able to transmit throughout the swarm using the synaptic link to empower units as the hive mind deems fit, suiting the demands needed to devour the foe. The basic warrior has been identified as being able to refine the ability of other Tyranids, or themselves in the deployment of their weapons, making the recipients of this ability all the more precise. The Tyranid Prime has been detected enhancing ferocity, not a berserker frenzy, but rather a cold and calculated brutality that makes the recipients more efficient in their quest for the kill. Kriptman's vain gamble to end the Tyranid threat has also erased one of the core vulnerabilities in the race. When the Ultramar Scepter was assailed by High Fleet Beomoth, as the space battle raged, the destruction of primary vessels weakened and confused the rest of the fleet. On the ground, the slaying of whatever bioform was serving as the synaptic linchpin for the swarm distinctly hampered the effectiveness of that swarm. But thanks to Kripman's recklessness, High Fleet Leviathan has developed the ability to somehow transfer the synaptic load. When a beast responsible for primary control of the swarm falls, that neural responsibility is shunted to another synaptic abomination. And we can also continue to thank the Inquisitor for the additional abilities we are seeing in these warlords. They are now displaying more numerous abilities, becoming more cunning, outwitting and outflanking enemy deployments, making the beasts under their control more effective in battle, causing the shadow in the warp to be more disruptive and at greater distances, and even evolving the living ammunition of weapons like the grotesque flesh borer to a new and terrible lethality. We shall see what other horrors we can thank Inquisitor Kripman for as High Fleet Leviathan tests the Cordon Impenetra, or what other aberrations fresh Hive Fleets will bring when they inevitably emerge from beyond the Galactic Rim. Because as we have explored in previous lectures, it is still unknown whether we are enduring random swarms or the probing scout tendrils of the full Tyranid race. But the Imperium will stand. We will prevail. The Xenos will burn. Praise be to the God Emperor.